So Green labels this position that she's describing the um, theory of the eccentric position. Um, and this is a concept borrowed from Helmuth Plesner. The idea is that human beings, so the idea of the eccentric positionality in Plesner, which Green briefly uh, summarizes here in the essay, is that humans are distinctive among animals in that they, they both have an experience of things and uh, are conscious of things in their environment through their senses, for instance, as a kind of experience from the center outward where they're just, they're experiencing things they come into contact with and um, their, their cognitive apparatus is processing that information and is it, and, um, and contributing to, uh, or, or um, processing that information, which in turn is um, interpreted by their cognitive apparatus and allows them to respond in certain ways. Okay, so that's happening, a kind of experience of the environment from the center of the organism outward to the environment. But there's also for human beings um, an, an added complexity that Plesner strangely, it, this it sounds like kind of a weird idea when, when you uh, describe it the first time, but that humans can see themselves from the outside. They can, they can take a position on themselves from outside of that centered animal kind of position. So like other animals, they have desires, they have experiences and the experiences inform what they do. But unlike other animals, they can take an outsider perspective on their own desires and their own experiences, which means they can do things like ask, are these the best desires to have? Um, do, are the, do, do, I, do I really want these things or do I just think that I want these things? Um, are, is this behavioral pattern, this connection between experience and, and, then, and then a reaction, is that the best one for me to have? Or, or could I cultivate some other uh, pattern of reaction to stimuli like this? So humans have an added um, level of control over their own interaction with environments because they can, as it were, stand outside themselves and ask questions about how they want to set their own behavioral program or pattern. And Ple Plesner and I think Green um, say that this is an explanation of something that the ancient Greek philosophers and, and other philosophers in the Western tradition have often just called reason, that humans are able to critically reflect on their condition. They're able to ask what would be better or worse, what are the reasons for and against doing something. They're able to describe a situation and use that description to help them, that description as a kind of analysis, to help them see what their options are for confronting the situation differently. Um, and so that capacity, which again, I, Plesner says is unique to humans, and Green echoes him here. You might ask whether it is fully unique to humans. Maybe there are some animals, maybe some higher mammals, maybe some other primates or dolphins can do this to some extent. But it does seem like humans are able to engage in some greater degree of critical reflection and control over their own behavior than a lot of other, most other animals um, are able to do. And this is described here with this notion of the eccentric positionality. When Plesner proposed this idea, he also presented three principles which were, um, kinds of consequences or implications of this eccentric positionality. And Green follows Plesner in going over these in her essay, uh, but she does describe them a little bit in her own way. So I'm just going to summarize what Green says about them, her, um, her interpretation of them as I understand it, uh, and let you uh, make of that you know, what you will. Um, the first of these is natural artificiality. So the basic idea here is that humans are humans engage with the artificial. Humans engage with things that are made by other humans, that are made differently from how they were uh, just inherited by humans. They're not the things that are made not in accordance with an innate program of human beings, but 
something that is invented or constructed or a matter of historical tradition, something artificial in that sense, not natural in that sense. For human beings, it's natural to be artificial. It's natural to make use of the artificial, to produce the artificial. So there's a kind of paradox here in that it's natural for human beings to not be natural. It's natural for human beings to be something more than natural or something other than what's natural. Uh, and that's, a, that's an interesting paradox. But if you think about it, it is, it's, there's something about it that really sounds right about people because as long as there have been human beings, um, based on what we know about the archeological record, as long as there have been human beings, there have been tools. And so human beings and tool use seem to go together and tools uh, tend to vary from culture to culture and tradition to tradition. So the artificiality point here is trying to capture something of that, of the kind of uh, the natural variability of human artificial constructions and use of artificial constructions. Another point is that people experience reality as if it were the true reality, but they only experience it immediately. That is, they only experience it through things like language or interpretations. And so again, there's a kind of paradox here that we, we have a sense that we can get, that there's a distinction between uh, say an illusory and a real perception of how things are. That there's a distinction between a, a more refined or a more accurate and a less accurate description of how the world is. But to get to the more accurate description, like for instance, the descriptions in the modern sciences, to get to the more accurate description, we actually need more immediacy, not more, not more immediacy directly. We get the more immediate grasp of the world only through the mediation of language and theories and the history of science as it's developed up to that point. So it takes a lot of sophistication, a lot of, say, um, artifice. It takes a lot of, of, of the artificial in order for us to get at the natural that's a part of the world, the reality of the world. And you see how this kind of um, this kind of recasts some of the problem of the problem of the external world as we saw it in Descartes and Hume. It's no longer a problem of how can we get at, at reality directly, but it's more um, an issue of, or it's recognizing the value of mediation in getting to the world directly. And then finally, there's this um, point that she calls the utopian standpoint, which is basically the ability to always take a critical position, regardless of whatever the current situation is, it's always possible to, um, to criticize it in some way. It's always possible to stand outside of one's current position and ask, um, is this the best position or is there something that could be changed to make it better? So. That's what Plesner calls a utopian standpoint. It's a kind of endless capacity for critique. So that's the view that Green favors uh, overall. She thinks it's better than dualism, it's better than materialism, and it's better than idealism. Uh, it treats human beings as a part of nature, um, but an eccentric part of nature, which means that they're able to critically reflect on their own understanding of things. They're able to kind of step outside their own perspective and ask about better and worse in regard to it, which means that they're able to, um, to learn about nature and manipulate nature in a way that other organisms aren't able to do. Uh, and that includes things like reason and um, reasoning and being able to grasp something of the objective character of the external world. Um, with that, I will just leave it to you to say whether you uh, have any objections to this. Um, I will mention just one objection. Uh, it's an objection I, I mentioned in another video about pragmatism. So in some ways you could read Green's view as a type of pragmatism, even though she didn't call herself a pragmatist, the view she's describing is one that emphasizes a view of the knower, 
the uh, the knower as a situated being um, and as an acting being, as a being that is engaged with the objects of its knowledge um, in a dynamic and active way, because persons are part of nature, if persons are a part of culture in an, in an active way. They, are, they, they learn things, they begin to practice. She uses words like embodiment or expression, and those are action words. Those are words that describe a way that something acts and, and acts in a context and in a relation with other things. So if that's the case, then I think we can ask the question of whether Green has in some ways begged the question about what reality is like and has begged the question about um, the legitimacy of our knowledge of that reality. Because since she's describing the knower as a person, she's describing the knower already as an acting, embodied, and situated being, she must um, have assumed that there is a place for that actor to be situated and that there are such things as bodies and so on. But remember, Descartes, when he was seeking a stable foundation for all of his knowledge, called all those things into doubt. And he had a lot of anxiety about whether he could legitimately believe anything um, else, he, whether he had a solid a solid reason, a good reason, a reason better than the alternatives for believing anything else, if he couldn't demonstrate, uh, for instance, that there wasn't an all-powerful evil genius deceiving him about everything he perceived. So the point there is just to say, Green doesn't seem really to have confronted the skeptical problem that, Green, that um, Descartes presents in Meditation One. Green seems to have kind of stepped over that problem and described human beings as persons and a part of nature. And she says that view is better than dualism. But if you think like Descartes, then you're going to, at this point, be really suspicious and say, look, you, any, anybody can just describe reality as being however they think it is. The trick is to be able to prove it. And you, Green, haven't proven it. You've just described it a certain way and say, said to your audience, doesn't this make sense to you? Um, whereas I, Descartes, have called everything into question and started from the foundations and derived things from there, and that's a better way to proceed. So I, I just want to, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with that Cartesian objection, but I'm saying that it, it's possible at least to question Green's view along these lines. And um, I would invite you to question her view along those lines or along any other lines, if there's anything else about her way of thinking that you uh, think uh, could be challenged. Um, I myself find this Green's way of thinking a very instructive and, um, and very promising way of thinking. Um, I'd like to believe that she's basically right about what she's saying here, um, but I do have a few sus suspicions about how she's laid out the argument.